Welcome to Money for Lunch. In this segment, I'm being joined by radio contributor and thought leader, Steve G. Jones. You guys probably remember Steve. He is an expert in the area of hypnotherapy. He has written over 20 best-selling books in the area of hypnotherapy. Steve G. Jones, welcome back to Money for Lunch. Thanks, Bert. Good to be here. All right. So, you know, I wanted to dive into this because a lot of people have a misconception of hypnotherapy. As a matter of fact, we're in Vegas, and a lot of people think of hypnotherapy, and they think of all these Vegas acts. How does hypnotherapy really work? Well, we can draw the distinction between stage hypnosis and clinical hypnotherapy. So, okay. in Las Vegas, there are a lot of stage hypnosis shows, and the idea there is to entertain. You know, somebody's talking in their shoe, thinking it's a phone. Somebody's dancing with a room, thinking it's someone they're dancing with, a human. And that's great, and you can actually get people in that hypnotic state and have them do that. That is real, believe it or not. There are people who are that suggestible. And the hypnotist will find them and bring them on stage. Now, in clinical hypnotherapy, which is different than that, the standard's different. We're looking for weight loss or helping people stop smoking or helping people overcome a fear, helping them improve their confidence. That's what we're looking for. So both are real, both are legitimate, but they have two different outcomes. Okay, but it's more or less the same process, right? Yes, putting someone into hypnosis. Now, in a clinical setting, we will take more time because we don't have to kind of rush things to get to the show. In a, in a stage hypnosis show, the induction part, of putting them into hypnosis will last about five minutes. They try to keep it short, and they get people who are highly suggestible so they can do that. In a clinical setting, we may take more like 15 minutes to a half an hour to do that. Okay, so walk me through that. When you say induction, what is that process all about? Well, an induction is inducing the hypnotic state. So you take them on a relaxing walk in the woods or a relaxing walk on the beach or uh, have them imagining floating on a, on, a, on a raft in a pool if that's relaxing for them. Right. And we're not necessarily saying we're going deeper or deeper or anything at that point. We're just painting a relaxing picture. After the induction comes the deepening or deepening that or intensifying what we did in the, in the induction. So that's when we're counting down. 10 to 1, go downstairs, with the sun setting, or something like that. And then we can program them. Gotcha, okay. So, when you say programming, now how does that programming take effect? I mean, is it that quick, like you see in a stage, or does it sometimes take a couple of, uh, uh, we call it, um, sessions? Sometimes it does. Now, Harvard and Stanford got together a while back and created the scale of susceptibility, as they call it. I like the word suggestibility more, but that's what they call it the scale of susceptibility, and everyone, as it turns out, can be measured on that scale. So it's sort of like electrical conductivity. Everyone is suggestible to some degree, just like every substance on the planet will conduct electricity. Some conduct it well, like metal. Some, like wood, don't conduct it very well. But every substance conducts electricity, just like every person is suggestible. So those who are more suggestible, more open to hypnosis, will require fewer sessions and may find immediate change. Gotcha. And those who are less may require more sessions. Gotcha. Okay. And so when you're dealing with somebody who is uh, uh, less susceptible to hypnotherapy, is it because what makes them less susceptible susceptible than somebody than somebody else? Are they stubborn? Is it a fear? Is it, or do we not know? According to the Harvard scale, uh, which was also developed by Stanford, there, a lot of it has to do with uh, early childhood. Really? Uh, believe it or not, yeah. A lot. Now, this is, you know, we're taking the Harvard and the Stanford scale and saying that it's probably correct. And if it is correct, then it indicates from a theoretical basis that a lot of it could very well have to do with how much, how they were controlled and, you know, as kids and so forth. But there's also the nature versus nurture. Some of it's nurture, their environment, but some, right. of it, some of it seems to be innate. Some of it seems to be something we're born with. And a lot of people get mistaken about this. They think, well, my mind's too powerful to be hypnotized. <laughs> I'm too intelligent to be hypnotized. Uh, intelligence doesn't correlate uh, that way to hypnosis. In fact, sometimes more highly intelligent people are easier to hypnotize. So it's not a valid argument to say I'm too intelligent to be hypnotized. But it's multifactorial. Uh, the jury's still out, but the research tends to indicate that it's, na it's nature, you know, what we're born with, our environment, nurture, and it's also a little bit about the state we're in at the time. When you drink a lot of coffee before the hypnosis session, you probably won't go into hypnosis. Gotcha. Okay. Now, uh, you mentioned relaxation helps to, to uh, the process along. So, uh, and you just mentioned that caffeine will probably uh, prevent that from happening. So somebody who is already relaxed, we're very tired, is going to be more susceptible in theory? 
Uh, theoretically, they would be more apt to go to their level of suggestibility that they normally have, and less likely to, you know, to fight it, which is great. Now, on the other hand, you would think being drunk would help. You right. You think being drunk would You're make You're already them. kind of relaxed. Yeah, but it's not the case. And really? ask any stage hypnotist, yeah, throw people off the stage. Because they, <laughs> they're following something, but it's not what the hypnotist is saying. They're following whatever they want to do. I like that. <laughs> and if you're drunk, get off the people. All right. So, all right. Okay. And there was a gentleman I read, uh, Dr. Milton Erickson. Yeah. Okay. And he said that we are constantly on our own trends. Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. We create our reality. You know, what I see right now is different from what you see. It's sure. all based on our perception of the world. Everyone sees things differently. And it's because of the trends that we're in. And again, part of it is what we're born with. Right. A lot of it has to do with how we are raised and how we are taught to perceive things and our experiences that we've had. You know, and I related a lot to a lot of us kind of uh, mechanically uh, uh, will drive from work to home. Yep. And we get lost in our thoughts and all of a sudden, you know, we're at our home and we don't know how we got there. We were in a deep trance, but, you know, but at the same time we were aware of what was going on because we were able to navigate the streets. Yes. So if we're already in a trance state, you know, it seems like transformation, that change would come a little bit quicker, but it seems like it's very stubborn. It can be because you're, it depends on what you're exposed to every day. Exactly. Now, what you're talking about now literally is a trance state in that moment, and people who have difficulty remembering the drive home, they tend to be very good hypnotic subjects. Do you, are you following that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I might, I might. I think I've done that a couple of times. All right. <laughs> yeah. What happens is it's nothing to be scared of. You just go down to the state called alpha more easily. Beta is full awakening consciousness. Where yeah. we are right now, fully engaged, fully alert. If we slow down just a little bit, we go into alpha, which is the lightest state of hypnosis. And that makes sense because a lot of people refer to me as an alpha male. There so you now, go. Now you know. They mean you're in hypnosis. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I like that. All right. All right. So now, again, back to this, this uh, compare and contrast that we're doing. You see these guys on stage. They take these subjects and they make them quack like a duck or talk in the shoe or do all sorts of weird stuff yep. that normally you couldn't get people to do. Right. A lot of people who say they wouldn't do that end up doing it. Right. So can now can I put somebody under hypnosis? Can you put somebody under hypnosis and really get them to do stuff that they normally wouldn't do? Well, not in uh, not in the sense of getting them to violate their morals. Not in the sense of getting not in them a sinister to, way. Right. Right. Not getting them to hurt someone or. Or anything like that, but there are things that it, it's kind of like the, you would do the things that you would do when you drink. So whatever you might do when you drink a little bit too much. Now, of course, if you go on stage drunk, they don't want that. You're not going to follow any directions. But a person who goes on stage for a stage hypnosis show is very likely to come out of their shell a little bit, do those things they might normally do if they loosened up a little bit and had fun. Sometimes they go a little bit beyond that, but they don't go in the direction of committing. Uh, crimes or anything like that. You know, there's a movie, uh, Curse of the Jade Scorpion by Woody Allen that came out a few years ago, and uh, he calls up someone and says, Madagascar. And the person hears that, they have to either rob a bank or rob their neighbor. So they're activated by that. Right. That's not something that would happen. That's not reality. That's science fiction. Exactly. I love it. I love it. All right, guys, if you're having problems, if you want to get over something, if you want to have better memory, better health, check out stevegjones.com the largest library of personal development you'll ever find under hypnosis. Stuff works like that. I use it myself. And I guarantee if you go there, you're going to find something that's going to help your life just be better. Steve G. Young, thank you so much for stopping by. Well, thank you, Bert. You bet.